You're listening to Spring River Chronicle. Audio on the go. First National Banking Company. Get checking that pays with Super Plus Checking at FNBC. Newspaper Sioux City. White River Current plans to file suit, according to co-owner Rich Fisher, citing FOIA law. By Lauren Siebert. The Calico Rock City Council, located in Izzard County, held a meeting January 16 to discuss the banning of video recording at the city council meetings. According to Rich Fisher, co-owner of the White River Current, the council passed the revised procedures banning video recording almost unanimously, with one abstention. Arguments have been made in the past by other city councils stating that recordings are disruptive and distracting, however, according to the Freedom of Information Act FOIA 25-19-102 cited by Fisher, the interest of the public must be served, overriding concerns of convenience. In the section entitled Legislative Intent, the FOIA specifically states, it is vital in a democratic society, that public business be performed in an open and public manner, so that the electors shall be advised of the performance of public officials and of the decisions, that are reached in public activity and in making public policy. Toward this end, this chapter is adopted, making it possible for them or their representatives, to learn and to report fully the activities of their public officials. According to Fisher, during the course of the Calico Rock City Council meeting, a visiting photographer representing the Baxter Bulletin stood up to get a better view for the purpose of taking a photo of the council and those surrounding the table. Mayor Ronnie Guthrie advised the photographer that he must resume his seat and was not permitted to move around the room to take photos. Fisher went on to report that when asked by the photographer if there was an ordinance in place to that effect, the mayor replied, yes. In an offline conversation, the photographer advised that in his 25 years of covering and photographing public meetings he had never encountered such a constraint on his movements. The question has been raised before by Representative Clark Hall in a question to Attorney General Dustin McDaniel, who replied in the form of Opinion 2010-063. In response to the question, what actions may the City Council take, if any, to prohibit the use of the City Council meetings being recorded without the governing body's consent? Attorney General McDaniel's answer was, assuming the FOIA applies to the recordings, the city cannot take any actions that would prohibit people's access to the recordings under the FOIA. McDaniel continued, the FOIA defines a public record in such a way that an audio or video recording showing the performance or lack of performance of an official function qualifies as a public record. Public records means writings, recorded sounds, films, tapes, electronic or computer-based information, or data compilations in any medium, required by law to be kept or otherwise kept, and which constitute a record of the performance or lack of performance of official functions, which are or should be carried out by a public official or employee, a governmental agency, or any other agency. According to Fisher, since the Calico Rock City Council has formally prohibited video recording of council meetings, the White River Current plans to move forward with a lawsuit against the city for violation of the Arkansas Freedom of Information Act FOIA. An attorney who specialized and has extensive experience in FOIA litigation has been recommended to the current by the Arkansas Press Association legal team. Fisher said, contact has been initiated and legal action should be forthcoming in short order. Fisher further explained that the current also intends to bring the situation to the attention of the Arkansas ACLU, requesting that organization's involvement and assistance in bringing the city into FOIA compliance. Mayor Guthrie could not be reached for comment. You're listening to Spring River Chronicle. Audio on the go. First National Banking Company. Get checking that pays with Super Plus Checking at FNBC. Hardy Fire Causes Extensive Damage. By Lauren Siebert. The Hardy Volunteer Fire Department responded to a fire on January 6, on Newsom Street in Hardy after a neighbor saw smoke rising from a neighbor's home. According to Fire Chief Carol Traw, when he arrived at the fire, the neighbor who had placed the call was waiting outside. Traw asked if anyone was home, and the neighbor advised he did not believe so, as the owner's vehicle was gone. As smoke rose out of the attic vents and eaves mostly from the north end of the home, firefighters could not see inside the home, as the smoke blocked their view through the windows. After Chief Traw turned off the gas to the residents, and once the firefighters ran hoses close enough to the house to reach the flames, they pried open the door and flogged the interior, allowing the interior to cool enough for the firefighters to locate the fire. According to reports, the fire originated in the kitchen. After identifying the point of origin, the firefighters went to the side door of the house where the kitchen was located and were able to put water on the blaze. After several minutes of fighting the fire, they were able to extinguish the most obvious portion of the fire, although smoke was still rolling out from the open doors, attic, and the broken window. Once the fire was out and exhaust fans had mostly cleared the smoke, an electrician cut power to the home and the firefighters began to investigate the cause of the fire. 
According to reports, the gas stove located in the kitchen appeared to have caused a fire, with one of the burners in the on position, and a fry daddy pan sitting on it. Damage was extensive to the home, especially where the fire had burned through the ceiling and the north wall of the kitchen into the bathroom. There was severe smoke and heat damage in most of the house, and water damage in the living room and kitchen. As standard procedure, firefighters removed enough wallboard near the fire to make sure the fire was completely out, and would not reignite, and finished by cleaning up some of the debris from the interior. You're listening to Spring River Chronicle. Audio on the go. First National Banking Company. Get checking that pays with Super Plus Checking at FNBC. Traffic stop yields multiple charges. By Lauren Siebert, numerous charges were brought against Lydia Villapondo, 35, after a routine traffic stop January 6 by Cherokee Village Police Officer Chris Spurlock. When Spurlock approached the vehicle, he first noted that the suspect was the only occupant of the vehicle. According to reports, after being provided with the occupant's name and date of birth, Spurlock proceeded to run the information through the state computer. The name and date of birth provided did not return. Spurlock stated he re-verified the information, and noted he had taken it down correctly the first time. At this point the suspect volunteered that she possessed a suspended license, due to a DWI charge. Spurlock then called for his partner, Officer Tamara Taylor to assist. Upon her arrival, the suspect Villapondo was removed from the vehicle and Taylor conducted an officer safety pat-down. Approximately $500 was found on her person but no weapons or contraband. The driver's front door remained open, because Villapondo had just been removed. While Spurlock was standing next to the open door, he noticed there were several assorted colors and sizes of pills lying on the floorboard, between the edge of the driver's seat and the bottom of the door frame. According to reports, when Villapondo was asked what these pills were, she advised that they were her ox, or oxycodons. Spurlock then asked why they were so many different colors and sizes, if they were all the same prescription drug. Philipondo then explained some were muscle relaxers and she had two different strengths of ox. The pills were retrieved by Taylor, and placed in the driver's seat. According to reports, while Spurlock was retrieving an evidence bag, Philipondo requested to get her Dr. Pepper from the console. As Spurlock began to walk away, Taylor saw her grab a pill out of the seat and swallow it, using her drink to wash it down, but Taylor was unable to stop her. When Spurlock returned with the evidence bag, Philipondo was handcuffed in front, the cuffs were double locked and she was placed in front of the patrol car. Philipondo's vehicle was then searched, and a Walgreens prescription for 15 mg oxycodone pills, belonging to the driver, was found between the driver's seat and middle console by Taylor. The bottle contained 18 small round blue tablets that were later identified as oxycodone 30 mg, and 46 small round green tablets later identified as oxycodone 15 mg. According to reports, this bottle and the loose pills mentioned earlier were the only contraband located during the search of the passenger compartment. The loose tablets that had originally been recovered were later identified as 210 mg cyclobenzaprine, 250 mg trazodin and the fifth pill was a small round blue tablet. Spurlock noted the blue tablet is what the suspect swallowed earlier. As the search went on, Taylor and Spurlock found another prescription bottle containing a mix of pills. After the vehicle search was complete, Philipondo was transported to the Sharp County Jail. She was administered a urine drug screen by the jail staff, after admitting to officers that she had used marijuana and methamphetamine the previous day. Philipondo tested positive for methamphetamine, THC, opioids, and oxycodone. She was charged with operating with faulty equipment, driving on a DWI suspended license, public intoxication, obstructing governmental operations, and tampering with physical evidence. An additional charge of possession of a controlled substance was added January 8. You're listening to Spring River Chronicle. Audio on the go. First National Banking Company. Get checking that pays with Super Plus Checking at FNBC. New Hardy Restaurant Opens, Bringing Irish Classics to Hardy. By Lauren Siebert A new restaurant has opened in downtown Hardy January 7- The Spotted Fin, an Irish-style restaurant bringing new and different cuisine to the Quad Cities area. According to co-owner Mark Gordon, the Spotted Fin has replaced the Garlic Rose in hopes to better serve the community. It was the Italian restaurant which did well, Gordon said, but we got to thinking, being up here in the summertime, when it's 114 degrees, a big heavy plate of pasta wears heavy on you. Gordon noted also that this restaurant environment would be much more casual than the Garlic Rose had been. We toned it down as well, Gordon said, I think the Italian place was nice, but with the white linen tablecloths, Gordon explained, people wearing flip-flops walking by, would look in and think that it was too expensive for them. We want to make this a casual place. Along with the change to casual comes a change in cuisine as well. 
We try to do it where, no matter what your economic position is, there's something you can eat, Gordon said. We've got everything from hamburgers to sit-down dinner fish meals. According to Gordon, as they were building the Spotted Fin menu, they wanted to offer the community new food options, but without taking away from other dining establishments. We need the support of the locals. We're not trying to take anything away from the established people, Gordon noted. We were careful not to put anything on the menu that Big John had, because we eat there too, Gordon explained. They need to make theirs, and we need to make ours. We believe if there are enough people, who will come out and eat when it's cold, we'll be all right. The Spotted Fin is running on a limited menu until the end of February. We were waiting to see what the weather was going to do, because a lot of items that I haven't included take a huge amount of prep, Gordon said. I want everything to be good and fresh. I don't want to have to throw it out right away, he continued, so we're going to work off this menu a little longer. I'm trying to make sure what we do, we do really well. According to Gordon, along with the regular foods, he believes the Irish cuisine will be successful. Some of the Irish food we think will do good, people are already wanting some, Gordon said, we'll have things like the Atlantic cod, Guinness onion soup, lamb soup, and Scottish eggs. Although the garlic rose has been replaced, some of the local favorites will carry on with the spotted fin and, according to Gordon, hopefully some of the new favorites as well. We're going to keep a good amount of the Italian food that people liked when they were here before, Gordon noted, but on our po' boy sandwiches they've seemed to be a hit. One of the plans to improve the spotted fin over time is to get the community fully involved. What we're looking for the local people to do is let the kids feel like they're a part of this, and even the adults, Gordon said, if they've got really old photos or new photos of the kids playing ball, in the band, cheerleading, fishing, hunting, canoeing, or water skiing, we don't care what it is, Gordon said, we want something that has to do with this area. If they bring it in an 8x10 frame we'll put it on the wall and they'll have it when they come in. According to Gordon, all the owners of the Spotted Fin are here to stay. We came here, brought our families we're not rich people that came up for a hobby, we came here to become a niche in the community, Gordon said, we plan to live here, raise our kids here. Thanks for listening to Spring River Chronicle Audio on the Go. Be sure to subscribe to the paper and check us out online at myspringriver.com.